Hi, it's Jose from Newton, and I wanted to talk to you today about rankings of business schools and what they mean and what you should be thinking about as you look at them. Now, there's a few different main sources of rankings, the US News, Business Week, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and let's talk about each of them and their strengths and weaknesses. I tend to rely mostly on US News and Business Week. I think they're the most accurate. They're also the earliest, which I think is also related, because what happened was Wall Street Journal and Financial Times came along later, and they thought, hey, we're financially oriented. We should produce our own rankings of MBA degrees. And we can't make them look just like US News and Business Weeks. That would be lame, and no one would buy our no one would buy them. What's the point of buying something that's exactly the same? So they shuffled up their criteria, and they produced all kinds of crazy results with schools that people don't think of that highly, you know, at the top of the list, and the schools that people do think of highly, you know, lower down. I remember when Wall Street Journal first produced their rankings, Stanford, uh, which most people think is the first or second best business school in the world, was ranked number 17 or number 16 or something. It was crazy. I, I was actually working on Wall Street at the time, and most of the traders just sat around laughing. And even the people who went to Harvard Business School, um, uh, you know couldn't resist chuckling over how silly those rankings were. Uh, so let's talk about US News and Business Week first, and what you're going to see if you look at those rankings. Well, I'll tell you what you're going to see. You're going to see a very, very high correlation between uh, GMAT score, of uh, the median GMAT score of those schools, average starting salary of uh, its graduates in the first year, and um, percentage employed at graduation by school. There's an extremely tight correlation, an almost perfect correlation between those three things. So what you're going to find uh, when you get into business school and you're at business school is that there's no dispute whatsoever between um, your, uh, your peers, the other students, as to what the best business schools are. It's totally clear. Uh, in fact, the best way to produce rankings would just be to go survey some business school students because they'll tell you what the best schools are. And what, the way they judge it, and, and you know, business school students, is who's got the top starting salary at graduation. And those numbers don't change. The, the, the same schools produce the same starting salaries year in and year out. It's this exact same order. And uh, that's probably the single best way to rank schools. Um, and US News is the closest to that, um, where the, the, the starting salary at graduation is pretty much the order of their rankings. So um, as I said, that correlates almost perfectly to GMAT score. Um, there's, a, the, uh, there's virtually no daylight between um, who's got the highest um, starting salary and who's got the highest GMAT score all the way down the list. All right, so um, let's talk for just a second though about international schools and what you can do with those because the US News and Business Week rankings don't really do a great job of covering international schools. Now, FT came along, Financial Times, they're international, and they started covering international schools. A couple things about the FT rankings they're not as reliable in terms of American schools as US News and Business Week, and they tend to overinflate, in my opinion. Um, the rankings of the UK schools. Now, there's a number of fine UK programs. I just think that the FT rankings consistently over, uh, overinflate the, their numbers. They make them a little bit too high on the list. Um, there, frankly, aren't as many great international programs, business, uh, business degree programs, um, as there are US programs. And there's, there's a reason for that, which is that the MBA degree was invented um, in America in 1904. Um, Harvard and Dartmouth dispute who came up with it, but they both did in 1904. And up until around 25 years ago, there were very few international universities even offering MBA degrees. And then a few very good ones in Sayad, London Business School, began doing it, began doing it very well. Um, and if you're thinking about an international program, those would probably be at the top of your list. Um, you know, basically, what you should be thinking about in terms of international versus, versus US is where do you want to live? Because as you've probably heard, one of the most important things you get out of business school is your personal network, the other people you meet. And that is, not to be underestimated. It is incredibly important. And it grows more powerful over time. Because your network, when you're one or two years out of school, is a bunch of other kind of junior people who themselves are one or two years out of school. But five years later, 10 years later, um, all those people you went to business school with are now running departments of companies. And that network becomes much more powerful. So if you want to live in the United States and you go to an international school, well, that network is not going to be that helpful to you because they're not going to come and settle um, you know, around where you live in the United States. Um, some schools have very strong regional networks. Stanford's network, as great a school as it is, Stanford's network is largely confined to the West Coast, to technology. If you want to do general management or marketing in the East Coast, that's, you know, that, that may not be that great of a fit for you. Obviously, it's a fantastic school. If you get in, you probably want to go. But there's other programs that might, um, might be even better for, you know, for if you want to do something internationally or, or if you want to do something on the East Coast not related to technology. So those are the kinds of things you should be thinking about in terms of rankings. 
the absolute order, um, the importance of GMAT score and the correlation between um, that and starting salary, and also uh, what is that school best at? And you know, if, if the school that is best for you is a few notches lower in the rankings, hey, you should take that as a good thing, because that might mean that you know, like NYU might be number 10, number 15, sometimes even a little bit higher, uh, easier to get into than Harvard or Stanford or Wharton, but really, really good for finance. So if you want to do finance, you know, that's, that's a great school. You should take that as, as a good thing that it's a, a couple of notches lower in the rankings. Uh, one last thing about uh, the importance of the GMAT, it's, it's an incredibly tight correlation, as I said, between GMAT score and average starting salary. Basically, every uh, uh, 10 points on the GMAT, which is every increment you can get uh, better on the test, correlates to $3,000 uh, improvement in average starting salary. So if you get 100 points better on the test, you know the difference between a 600 and a 700, that is um, $30,000. And that's just in the first year alone. And that number, of course, widens over time. If you're making $30,000 more in your first year, you're probably making $33,000 more in your second year, and on and on and on. Over the course of your career, that 100-point gap could end up being millions of dollars. Um, so long story short, uh, you want to um, obviously do very well in the GMAT, it's incredibly helpful. As you probably know, the most important thing is your work experience, GMAT's number two. And uh, you know, the better you can do on that, the higher you're gonna be on that curve, and the higher your starting salary is gonna be, and beyond.